Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Dundalk Wesleyan Church. Uh, will you join me and, and stand for our first song today? If you've been walking the same old road for miles and miles, if you've been hearing the same old voice tell the same old lies, if you're trying to fill the same old holes inside, there's a better life. There's a better life. If you got pain, he's a pain taker. If you feel lost, he's a way maker. If you need freedom or saving, he's a prison shaking savior. If you got chains, he's a chain breaker. We've all searched for the light of day in the dead of night. We've all found ourselves worn out from the same old fight. We've all run to things we know just ain't right. When there's a better life, there's a better life. If you got pain, he's a pain taker. If you feel lost. Somebody testify If you believe it If you receive it If you can feel it Somebody testify, testify If you believe it If you receive it If you can feel it Somebody testify If you got pain He's a pain taker. If you feel lost, then he's a way maker. If you need freedom or saving, he's a prison shaking savior. If you got chains, he's a chain breaker. If you need freedom or saving, he's a prison shaking savior. If you got chains. Oh, you may be seated. Sorry, I'm falling apart here. <laughs> awesome stuff. Well, good to have you all here. If you don't know who I am, my name is Chris. I'm the pastor of the church. Just want to welcome everyone here today. A uh, few things that we want to share for announcements-wise. I think I better find it. We send out our announcements uh, weekly in a church weekly email. If you're interested in getting that email, just let me know, and I'll add you to the list. It's awesome stuff. Lots of stuff to cover here. And so when we look at what's going on at our church, uh, we just have a, a few things that are happening coming up. Uh, as you notice, it came into the sanctuary or came into the church. There's a whole pile of winter coats and stuff like that. And uh, we've been collecting that over the last few weeks and been giving it away as we've been getting it. But there's lots more. And so today, um, from two to four, uh, we're having uh, and we're inviting the community to come. And if there's a need uh, that they can take the, any winter gear that the, could be useful for their families. And in saying that, if you guys know people who you think could be of, uh, who could have help with this, feel free to grab a winter coat or gear or whatever that's there uh, and take it with you to give to those uh, that uh, you know could be benefit from this. And all of this stuff that's left over, it's all going to be delivered um, to, what is the? So the health center, yeah. 
at the health center at the former Erkson Church. Yes. And so, and Sylvie's going to need help. So if you feel strong uh, and all that, uh, talk with Sylvie. And uh, yeah, it's important that we help with that. Um, coming up, we have the SEC dinner that's happening at the church uh, on uh, November 20th. And doors open uh, at 5.30, and then uh, dinner's... Uh, oh, that's December. Oh, oh yeah, that already happened. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I'm looking at last week's thing, so there you go. <laughs> I'm sorry about that, guys. Uh, we have a, a, a Secret Sisters Ministry book drive and exchange that's happening. Uh, Sylvia, is there stuff that we can get you to share? So there you go. It's uh, the, the Saturday, December 2nd, starting at 1 o'clock and goes to 3 p.m. Um, looking up at uh, another fellowship event that's happening. We're going to be happen having uh, on December 9th, we're having a gingerbread house competition. And Sylvie has a sign-up sheet to pass around there for families. can sign on one list, but if you're an individual, we'll, we'll get you to sign on the other side there. Uh, they're making it a competition. And I just wanted to share that uh, and someone who I don't know donated gingerbread houses uh, for this event, which is fantastic. So we really appreciate that. There's a, a women's uh, fellowship dinner that's happening on December 10th. And uh, you just need to contact Joanne Wilkie. She's not here today, I don't think. I don't see her. Uh, um, anyway, it is in that email, and you can reach out to her if you want to go to that dinner. We have some uh, things that are always happening at our churches, which is good. We have a Sunday morning prayer time, which is 9.30 to 10. After 10, we have a men's Bible study that meets here at the church again on Sunday mornings, 9.30 to 10.20, and that they meet in the pastor's study, and it's open to all the guys, so feel free to come. Uh, you don't, you know, if you missed a few, it's not the end of the world. Just come and be a part of it. We have two women's Bible studies. One is a midweek Bible study that happens here at the church on Tuesdays at 10 a.m. in the morning, and then another that happens on Thursday nights from 7 to 8. And information on that is in our email. Also, our library is looking for more resources. Eventually, our library is going to be moved into the room that says library. Amazing. But, <laughs> and, right. That's always the plan. So eventually that's going to happen. And as we expand our, our library, we're looking for more resources. So if you have children's books, Christian, children's Christian books uh, that you'd like to donate, or adult Christian fiction, uh, talk to Martin, who's right over there, and he'd be happy to receive your books. And there you go. Um, I think that's all the announcements that I wanted to share. I'm going to invite Linda up because we had something happen on Friday, which uh, was awesome. So on Friday night, we had a little um, uh, worship called Sacred Sounds, and it was wonderful. We had a little circle here, and we sang to Jesus uh, with all our hearts. We even had people from Mexico join us who have come to Canada, so that was wonderful. And so much touched my heart, but I must say that when language barrier um, separates, music connects. So here we are singing Christmas carols, and Spanish-speaking people can sing English Christmas carols. It was amazing. Praise God. He's so good. So our call to worship this morning is Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 to 30. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Father, it is amazing to be in this house. It's amazing that each one of us had a means to get here this morning. Thank you for everything that you are to us. Bless our time together here and bless our pastor as he is he speaks the word that you have given to us, Lord, and, and we receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. One announcement that I didn't uh, share yet and realized I hadn't. Um, last year at our annual meeting, our church has an annual meeting every year, uh, we 
And during that annual meeting, we vote on a budget for the year and things like that. One of the things that we ratified in that budget was to give to uh, World Hope $1,000. Now, World Hope is one of those NGO uh, organizations, non-government organization, that is actually connected to the Wesleyan Church. It's uh, one of those uh, organizations that tries to make a difference in this world, hitting uh, and dealing with practical needs. And so World Hope is striving to uh, provide clean drinking water to those who are in need. Now, I share all that because um, you've heard of Black Friday, right? And Cyber Monday, right? That's tomorrow. Well, Tuesday is called uh, Giving Tuesday. And it was kind of a response that started way back in 2012 on this idea of consumerism and spending money on, on, on items and all that. It is encouraging people to give on Tuesday. And World Hope has shared that they're going to be having matching grants to those things that are, get, are given up to a certain amount. I think it's $15,000. And so um, uh, our church, I talked with our church board, and we made the decision to release the funds that we had made a budget for. Our budget was $1,000 to give to World Hope. We're going to give that $1,000 on Tuesday so that it will have $2,000 worth of impact. And so here's a video that I want us to see, a show. I'm going to include in this weekly's email a link to World Hope. If you would like to, on your own, give to World Hope and contribute to this thing, you can uh, have your money matched as well. And so we're going to watch that little one-minute video just to see what we're doing as a church in the sense of making a difference around the world. When the clean water came, I could drink without fear of getting sick. When the clean water came, I was well enough to play outside with my friends. When the clean water came, I could stay in school. I want to be a nurse someday. When the clean water came, I knew our future was changing. When the clean water came, I started a business, and I provide for my family now. When the clean water came, I no longer had to walk on dangerous paths. I feel safe. When the clean water came, I began to dream. When the clean water came, I had hope. So there you go. So I am excited that we as a church are going to uh, uh, make that $1,000 contribution to their clean water program and, th and have that $1,000 make a $2,000 impact. So uh, praise God for that. And just thank you for your donations to the church that make that possible. So wonderful stuff. At this time in our service, we're going to uh, have our offerings. If we have some kids who would like to help pass the plates, that would be fantastic. You. All right, we got to work as teams, so maybe. All right, all right. So we pass the plate around. Can you help her? Awesome. All right. So we don't we we don't go down the same aisle that everyone else went down. <laughs> pick pick another aisle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Yeah. You got to keep going. You got to keep going. There we go. They're doing a fantastic job. Now, if you've got your plate done, then bring bring the plates back up here, guys. There we go. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you. 
Thank you. Now you can find a seat. Find your seat with your family. Thank you. <laughs> Did the kids do a good job? Yeah. I want to thank the kids for being part of our church service and helping us to worship God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, Lord. And I just reminded of that video of water and um, how there's so many things that I personally just take for granted till I'm reminded of just how important those things are. I, mean, I don't remember the last time I thanked you, God, that when I got up in the morning and I turned the tap on that there was clean water. Lord, there are so many things that you provide for us, so many things you give to us um, that we just assume and, and, and oblivious of. And so, Lord, we take a moment to give you thanks for that, for those things, like the air that we breathe, like the beautiful world we live in, the clean water. Thank you for meeting our needs and exceeding them. Thank you for blessing us so richly, Lord. And Lord, these are our tithes and offerings. We provide and bring them back to the church and offer them to you as an act of trust. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to continue to worship God through music. I raise it hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise it hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise it hallelujah. My way
the storm Louder and louder You're gonna hear my praises roar Up from the ashes Hope will arise Death is defeated The king is alive I'm gonna sing In the middle of the storm Louder and louder You're gonna hear
was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free. Oh, it's free indeed. I'm a child. Slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, he died. You may be seated. Now, before I forget, uh, I was it was shared with me that like yesterday we had a celebration of life for Don Nixon, and uh, we had asked the church if uh, people were able to to b donate food items for the uh, luncheon after, and you guys came through. There's so much food there that I was told that uh, if you'd like to have some of it and enjoy a little lunch before you, and when you're after church, you feel free. We're going to have the food out, and it's going to be good. Rather have it eaten and given away than thrown away, okay? So make sure uh, you, you uh, stay for that awesome stuff. Well, this time in our service is a pray, our time for prayer and praise. And uh, you guys have been wonderful at sharing the things that God is doing in your life and sharing the needs that you have. As always, I like to remind people to only share those things that they have permission to share. So if you want us to be praying for someone, you got to make sure that uh, any details you share, that you've had permission to do that. We want this to be a time of encouragement uh, and not a time that discourages people. And sometimes people uh, don't want, to, want their uh, private, whatever they're going through, shared. So we'll keep that in mind. 
Uh, as always, I would like uh, those who want to uh, share a praise point or a prayer request, to please stand and share your name. That way it helps us get to know each other as well. So there you go. Is there anything that someone would like to share as a praise or a prayer? To, a pr a prayer? Well, let's bring these to the Lord. Our Heavenly Father, God, just thank you for what a privilege it is to be able to be together and to share those things that are happening uh, in our lives. I like how Ron said, said uh, his eyes are open and that, God, you are working everywhere. And we see that. We see that in things like King's Kids, uh, where there's now 25 uh, children who are coming on a regular basis. And we give you thanks. As Sylvie mentioned, um, that they are keen to learn, that they want to learn. They're hungry to learn. And Sylvia has shared that uh, there are uh, needs. She'd been asking for more kids. She got more kids. She asked for a larger space. She got larger space. Now she's asking for help uh, with uh, snacks and all that. And so, Lord, we do pray that you provide in that area. And, Lord, uh, we just uh, know that there are many people who are going through a lot of struggles. Uh, we think of James's sister in law Sharon and her her battle and uh, Lord uh, she's not an old person and the family is young and so we think of James's brother and the girls and the rest of the family who are hurting Lord in our heads we feel that there's some sort of logical conclusion that they Older generation goes before the next and so on. And when this happens, when someone who's younger than us is coming to the end of their journey on this side of heaven, we struggle. And so we do pray. We pray for uh, the family. But we, we pray beyond that too on those of us who are grieving. It's hard to lose a grandpa. It's hard to lose anyone. And we miss those people who were a big part of our lives who left a big hole uh, when they passed on. We ask for your grace. We ask for your comfort. And Lord, even in those times of struggle, we give you praise. And we think of, of Norma and Chris with Harlow and just what a joy it is when a kid sleeps at night. <laughs> Again, we... We don't take these things for granted. Thank you, Lord, when, when the, our kids are doing well, when our kids are healthy. And I, I think of Luca's prayer request for Julia, knowing that she's just a little girl who's dealing with health issues that most of us grown-ups would be scared to go through. And his prayer was that she'd be able to spend time with family at Christmas. We just pray for her healing in her life and strength. And we think of our family members who are going through a hard time. You know, it's, uh, there's a lot going on, and there's lots on our plates, and it can be a really hard time for a lot of, pe a lot of people. And I think of Tia, and just pray for her. Lift her up. Help her in this struggle. And Lord, we think of Betty, who has had a long battle with cancer and who is now in a, a nursing home, and she is weak, unable to walk. We pray for your strength in her life. We continue to lift her up and ask for healing. We think of Dennis, who faithfully goes every day that he can to see her and spend time with her. Even when she's not up to talking, he just sits there to be with her. And we pray, Lord, that you give him strength. And I know, Lord, that as one, one uh, husband to another, that Dennis must be hurting to see his wife in that way. And so we pray for your comfort and grace upon him as well. Lord, we just uh, think of, uh, of, of uh, the prayer request that Marvin shared about his son, Alex. Thank God he's okay. And we thank you, Lord, for those who were able to do the surgery and to put them back together again. We pray that Alex learns from this. 
That's one of the good things about being young. You can make stupid de- thing, decisions and do things. We pray for wisdom in his life. And let's pray that, uh, that the bones that have been put together, that they will be strengthened and that he'll be okay. And Lord, as we think of, uh, of Lois's dad, we give you thanks for 99 years of life. But we also recognize for Lois and the rest of family that uh, that can be scary when their dad when dad's in trouble. And we give you thanks that he was okay, that you were with him. Uh, we just pray that you help him to avoid the ruts and stay safe. And we just think of of uh, the other prayer request that was shared about the pastor and the family and little Luke. And we pray for we pray for all of them. Oh, Lord, it's uh, in your hands. And, Lord, we think of uh, the praise report that Anna shared about all the kids in this church, and it is a joy to have so many. And we do pray for our teachers and our helpers who are uh, do, you know, giving of their time, of their energy, to pass on, to share uh, the faith with these kids. Help the kids to uh, to soak it up. Help the kids to learn. Help the kids to... Uh, listen to their teachers, and we pray for strength and energy for our teachers as well. Lord, we thank you for all of these things, and for those things that may not have been mentioned, we lift those up as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, talking about kids, we're going to have our kids' corner. I'm going to ask the kids just to sit on the floor right here for me, okay? That's easy. Yeah. All right, you guys got to face me, though, okay? All right. All right, you can sit right there. That's good. That's good. There you go. There you go. Awesome stuff. Come on. Yeah, that's good. You can have a seat right here if you want. You can sit right here. Good stuff. Well, it's so good to have all of you. Good to have you, too. You want to give me a fist bump? There you go. Good to have you guys. I have a toy here. This was actually my daughter. She's now 21, so she says she's done with toys. So she gives them to her dad because I'm not done with toys. <laughs> yeah, right? So, so I have a toy here. I have a toy here. I heard a whistle. You're a smart kid. Yeah, got a whistle. Okay, now this whistle is supposed to sound like something. I'm going to blow it, and you tell me what it's supposed to be like. Are you ready? Train. That's right. Your teacher has one of those. Good. So yes, this is this is from uh, a toy whistle that sounds like a train. It's not a dog whistle, no, but it's a train whistle. So uh, trains trains have whistles. Today's trains have air horns that sound like whistles, but the old steam engine trains. You guys know what the steam engine train is like. You know, it's, it has all that smoke that comes out of its stack. Right? Well, back in the day, like nowadays, we use things like cell phones and radios to communicate. But back in the day, those steam trains, they had whistles to communicate, kind of like signals, right? Saying, hey, and each one meant something. So I'm going to give you a signal. You tell me what you think it is. Okay, you ready? All right, here's the first one. What do you think that meant for a train? Yeah. There you go. It's all stop. Wow. There you go. All right. Well, let's, let's try this one, okay? Here's the second one. Are you ready? <laughs> go is right. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. I, you know, yeah, you guys are awesome. Okay, here, here's one. Are you ready? <laughs> nope. Nope. Do you, do you have an idea? I'll give you an idea. What do you think? Yeah! Train's backing up. Yeah. Okay. Here's one, and it should be annoying enough for everybody. So here we go. Are you ready? Yeah, and music to your ears. So what do you think that is? Yeah, <laughs> here you go. 
you got the alarm. So if you heard a train doing all those short little noises, it's saying, uh-oh, something's wrong, something's in trouble. And then some people would probably be running towards the train to figure it out. Others would probably be running away from the train going, uh-oh, something's wrong with it. Yeah, so the train, you know, the, the whistle was a really important part for all those who worked on the train because it helped them to know what was going on around them, right? And told them what to do and told them what they needed and things like that. We have that. We have that here with the Bible. That's part of what the Bible does is that the Bible teaches us. 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17 says, and, uh, all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, training, rebuking, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God, so that the boys and girls may be thoroughly equipped to do every good work. So, when you want to learn about what's going on in life, you want to learn about God, turn to the Bible. You want to learn out about uh, what God's doing in the world, turn to the Bible. You want to know how you're supposed to treat each other, turn to the Bible. If you want to know what's going to happen in the future, turn to the Bible. You know, if you want to know what, how you're supposed to use your money, turn to the Bible. Yeah. So the only way you're going to know this is if you spend time in the Bible. So you need to read the Bible or you get somebody else to read it with you. Okay. So that's what I do. I read my Bible every day. And so should you. There you go. Let's pray. Heavenly Father God, we just give you thanks. We thank you for your word, which we call the Bible. And Lord, thank you that we have access to it and that we can uh, turn to it whenever we want. We ask, Lord, that you help uh, us spend time reading and listening it as others read it to us. And Lord, when it comes to the Bible, help us to remember what it says and to also apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, and so our kids can go with... Uh, our uh, kids, our children's church. There we go. Let's follow everyone. Awesome stuff. There we go. Just go like that. Okay. Go down that way. There you go. For all of us, uh, we're going to be turning to the Bible. And today we're going to be turning to the book of Psalms. And if you have your Bibles with you or you use a Bible app, we're going to be turning to Psalm 46. I'm going to be reading verses 111. Again, that's Psalm 46, verse 111. So I don't know about you guys, but life is, can be pretty chaotic for me. It's, uh, sometimes I'm trying to split myself into a million pieces to do everything that has to happen. Am I the only one who's like that? No? Okay, good. All right. I always think it's going to get better, but, <laughs> um, you know, yeah. You know, when I think about between my kids who are adults, helping them, you know, and my parents uh, who uh, need more help, you know, from being busy paying the bills, you know, doing the work that I have to do, uh, you know, fixing the leaky faucet or cutting the grass. And yesterday it was fixing my vacuum. And so there you go, you know, buying groceries, you know, folding the laundry, all that fun stuff and a thousand other things that we have to do. You know, life is full. It really is. Now, I'm a type A guy, so every day I, I wake up, I have a plan, right? I, I, I have, I've got things I know I need to do and all that kind of stuff. And so, you know, you plan your day, you work hard, and if things go relatively smoothly, we, you know, we're, we're happy with that. We think, oh yeah, that's like what I expected. But then often that doesn't happen, does it? Now, there are some really big worldwide events that happen that we collectively go, oh, yeah, that's changed the world as we know it. I mean, for my, great -grand my, for my grandparents' generation, my grandparents' generation, it was uh, when Britain declared war uh, with Germany on September 3rd, 1939. Uh, for my parents, they mentioned John F. Kennedy's assassination on November 2nd, 1963. For my generation, it was 9-11 and the attack that happened on September 11, 2001. You, know, you, you don't forget where you were on those days, right? Those are world-changing events that we collectively remember. But more often, it's not those big, massive world things that happen that 
have an impact on our lives. It does, but not to that degree. It's the little things. It's the things that happen that are big in our lives and that shake us to the core. You know, loss of job, man, that's not fun. I've been laid off. I got laid off on Christmas Eve. Uh, can you believe that? That's not fun. But you get, you know, loss of a job, you know, the breakdown of a marriage, the pronouncement from a doctor for a devastating diagnosis, the death of a lo loved one, a phone call that my dad is on the ground, <laughs> you know, things like that. The souring of a relationship with one of our kids, that's all life-changing. And you know, I don't know about you guys, but I, I sometimes fool myself self into thinking that I'm in control. You know, and I start to think, when, things, when you have a few days where things go exactly the way you think it is, you're like, yeah, I'm in control. But then life happens. Things hit the fan, and uh, life falls apart before your eyes, and the world doesn't make any sense. And in those times, you ask yourself, what? Am I going to do? Well, that's what we're going to try and answer today. The title of my sermon is, and I like this title, the title of my sermon is, I'm not in control, but things are under control. I'm not in control, but things are under control. We're going to take a moment to pray, and then we're going to get right into our scripture. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, as we come to your word, we come with a question. When the world doesn't make sense anymore, what do we do? Lord, we ask for your leading as we do our very best to find the answer to our question. Bless this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And with that, we're going to get into Psalm 46, verse 111, where it says, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, Though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. The nations are in an uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done. The desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. That's an interesting section of scripture. By the way, it includes one of the hardest verses for me, which is be still and know that I'm the, I'm, <laughs> I am the Lord God. Yeah, I have a hard time staying still. So there you go. A big part of faith is about trusting in God. Our psalm begins with the words that show what kind of tra uh, faith that we're called, what kind of trust we're called to have. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. You know, Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your paths straight. You know, I... I love these verses, but I find them really hard to put into practice at times. You know, trust in the Lord. You know, not lean on your own understanding. There's a, a funny video that uh, I saw online. It's a group of guys uh, who played a little joke on their friend who was getting married, and they decided to convince the guy that they were going, you know, because he's getting married, and I guess he's, you know, giving his life to his wife and starting all over that uh, they were going to make it a symbolic gesture of him taking the big leap. So they convinced him that they were going to take him uh, bungee jumping and just to add a twist to it, they were going to blindfold him for the day. And so they spend time with him in different places for the day. He's blindfolded. He doesn't know what's going on. And they take him down this road, uh, dirt road, and all the twists and turns and all that. And it turns out they bring him right back to his home, to his backyard. 
where someone had already set up a big platform. And they give him a jostling and pushing him, and they get him onto this platform, and they put this uh, harness on him, and there's a rope tied to it. So they got him convinced he's going to go bungee jumping. But he's really only about two feet off the ground. And, you know, they're kind of nudging him over to the edge and making him feel that his foot's just right on the edge. And you can tell this guy is terrified. He's shaking. He's two feet off the ground. Yet he's, you know, quaking in his boots. Eventually, they say, you're going to jump. They don't do like the three-second thing, like get it over with, pull the Band-Aid off fast and all that. They, make, they do a count for like 30 seconds. He's standing on the edge for like 30 seconds. And they get down. And they get right down to, I think it was like, all right, two, one. And they push him. <laughs> and he falls. And he's terrified, but he's only two feet off the ground. And there's a little kiddie pool that he lands in instantly. You know, sploosh. And you just see him thrashing around in the water. He pulls up and pulls a blindfold off. He couldn't get over it. Sometimes it's hard to trust, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, you got friends like that, and you experience things like that. It's hard to trust. Hard to trust. I don't know if you guys know the guy named Joseph in the Old Testament. It's a pretty cool guy who uh, had a special coat with all these colors and all that kind of stuff. He was a favorite of his dad, which, uh, you know, he was a younger, a younger guy in the family. He was a favorite of his dad. I'm the youngest in my family, so I can understand why, right? But his brothers were jealous of him, and, uh, yeah, they were jealous of him. They resented him. And brothers being brothers, you know, they tried to get even, and they sold him off into slavery. Talk about trying to get even, but they sold him off into slavery. And Joseph ended up in Egypt where he was bought by Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh. And despite the unfortunate circumstances, Joseph remained faithful and dedicated to work. He trusted in God and God blessed Joseph and he prospered in Potiphar's household. And you think that might be the end of the story, but the problem was that Potiphar's wife took a liking to him and he resisted her advances, and she accused him of, of trying to do stuff with him, and jo Joseph ended up, no fault of his own, in a jail, in prison. And again, uh, he trusted in God, and God stayed with him. Uh, the scripture says in Ge uh, Genesis 39, 21, the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love, and God gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And Joseph's story is a, a really awesome story. You should read it. It's in the book of Genesis. And it ends up that Joseph uh, uh, is there for quite a while. He ends up uh, deciphering and explaining the meaning of some dreams. And eventually, because of this, because God had helped him through this, he ends up becoming the second most powerful person in Egypt. And we say, wow, all we have to do is do what Joseph does and trust in God. Sometimes it's easier said than done. Now, I started this sermon by sharing the title that I'd given it. Uh, it's a phrase that has been playing in my mind for weeks. I'm not in control, but things are under control. In our scripture today, we see how the writer had surrendered to the authority of God. In verse 7, it says in our scripture, the Lord Almighty is with us. God of Jacob is our fortress. God is our fortress. God is in control. I don't know. Maybe I've had a lot of friends like that group of guys who uh, convinced their friend he was going to go bungee jumping and didn't. You know, life experience has taught me, and I'm sure it has with you, that people lie. And people will play games. That people will let you down. It's sometimes hard for us to trust because of our experiences with people. Yet God... It's not one of our friends. In a sense, he's not one of these people. God is God. For us to trust in God, we need to embrace God's authority, which is uh, he has over us and that he has over everything else. This means that we've got to accept that God is not always going to do the things the way we think he's going to do. See, part of our experience with God is to say, God, I'll trust you as long as you do it my way. We're not God. 
right? We're not God. God will do stuff in ways that we might not expect. You know, it says in Isaiah 55, verse 8 and 9, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Moses is another person from the Old Testament. He was a guy who God called to lead the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt. They were slaves for a really long time. They had spent generations in slavery, and here's Moses, one guy being asked to lead an entire nation out into the desert, into the wild. And Moses says, and I would probably be saying a thousand other things to God if God had told me to do that, but Moses says and in Exodus, who am I that I should do, go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And you're taking a look at me? <laughs> How am I supposed to do that? Yet, despite his initial resistance, Moses surrendered to God's will, to his authority, and Moses found himself leading a nation of former slaves out of, out of uh, Egypt into the wilderness, heading towards the promised land. And when Pharaoh finally uh, let him go, it didn't take him long before he regretted his decision, said, you know what? I miss my slaves. I want them back. And he went after them. And then Moses, along with all the Israelites, they were in danger. They could have easily been destroyed. They were pressed up against the Red Sea. But here's the thing. This shows you how Moses had given up, his, had trusted in the authority of God. He said, you know, not my, my will be done, but yours, God. This is how we know, because Moses said to the Israelites in that moment of crisis, do not be afraid, stand firm, and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. Moses is a good example of what it means to surrender control and authority to God. Moses obeyed God's commands. He believed in his promises, and he acknowledged God's supremacy throughout his life. Learning to embrace God's authority over our lives will allow us to do things that otherwise is impossible for us. It opens the door to a whole new world, a larger world for us. When we are able to put our trust in God and submit our submit ourselves to his authority, something amazing happens. We find peace. That sounds really good to me. We find peace. Peace even in the chaos of life. Our scripture says in verse 10, be still and know that I am God. That's that verse that I say I have a hard time with. Putting our trust in God and submitting to his authority opens the door for us to have a meaningful and intimate relationship with God. He becomes real to us, not just some distant deity that has an influence in this world that, you know, got the earth spinning and said, there, it's up to you now. When we trust in God and we submit to his authority, we're able to see how God is active in our world and in our lives. Just as Ron has shared, uh, his eyes have been opened. He's seeing what God is doing. I think that's awesome. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That doesn't say, hey, guys, do everything you possibly can. Try and figure this out yourself, and you'll have peace. We're supposed to bring it to God. Trust in his authority. And when we do, we find peace. A few years ago, I hiked the entire Bruce Trail from one end to the other. And on this adventure of mine, I experienced peace, the peace of God, like I had never experienced before. It was during a really scary time. The Bruce Trail is approximately 900 kilometers long and goes from Niagara on the lake up to Tobermory. It's a fun little hike, to, for sure. I broke it down into doable uh, hikes that I, I did when I had the time. And the reason why I was able to do it so quickly was because of my wonderful wife, Tina, who helped me. She was my trail angel. That's a term that hikers use for those who help those who are on the trail. She was my trail angel. She drove me to the start of the uh, start of my day. She'd find some road that was in the middle of nowhere, right beside some bush, open the door, let me out, and drive away. <laughs> <laughs> she, 
She's such a loving person. <laughs> but Tina would do that, and, I, and she would meet me at the end of the day. And I'm a planner, so trust me, uh, you know, these things took a lot. My days out took a lot of planning. I had to put into uh, Tina's GPS each possible exit, and I used to plan exits for in case I got in trouble in some way every five kilometers or so. So all I had to do was text Tina, I'm at going to this exit, and she'd go there. And some of those hikes, she had to basically spend her day somewhere around there, go visit a mall or uh, spend some time. And so I knew she was always in the area. Well, there was this one hike, and it happened near Wyerton. And most of the time, uh, I had some sort of cell phone reception. It was funny. There was sometimes I was hanging off of an edge of a cliff with my cell phone to get the only little bar so I could talk to Tina. But uh, most of the time, it was just through text. And I would text Tina, I'm doing okay. I'm at this location, blah, blah, blah. And I would tell, text her saying, okay, look, it's about an hour from now. I'll be at this point. And that's the end of my day. And so uh, I texted Tina on this particular day that, okay, I'm almost to my exit. You can come and meet me there. And it just so happened that at that point, uh, we were right near a rock at Cliff. And um, behind me was really dense forest. And so I managed to get that text out, and she re managed to respond to me, I'm on my way, and I hiked the rest of the way, and I popped out where I was supposed to pop out, and there was no Tina. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I figure Tina driving a car is a lot quicker than me walking, so I was expecting her to be there, and she wasn't there. And to add to the trouble, where it was was really dense. So when I was texting Tina, sometimes I would get her text, sometimes I wouldn't. Sometimes the text would come in different orders than it was sent. It was making, like, really no sense. The last text that I got from her was a reference that she was on a road with large potholes. I don't know if I can keep going. I can't turn back. That was the last text I got from her. Boy, does that make you feel good. This was my adventure. I took on the risk. I didn't ask my wife to take on the risk. And I felt like a horrible husband. And I could feel the fear welling up inside me. Uh, and to make matters worse, my cell phone was almost dead. I was in the middle of nowhere. And I have left my wife somewhere in the forest. If you look at my wife and you see her toothpick little arms and all that kind of stuff. And I know that she's not a fan of being in the woods by herself thinking, what have I done? And so when I got to that point, I knew that Tina was probably going to be coming from the left because that makes sense, come from the left. GPS is going to bring her from the left. So I uh, uh, started running down the trail. I had hiked 40 kilometers. What do you do after hiking 40 kilometers with a backpack on? You go for a jog. So I ran left, and I started going down roads. And I ran around for about an hour. And I could not find her. Now it's getting dark. And I had managed to text. And by the time where I got to, I had finally got a text to my father-in-law, or stepfather. And he came along with a, other people who were familiar with the area. And they found me. We went back to where I had exited. And I had gone left. We went right. <laughs> And we found Tina about a half a kilometer down the road. I would have found her. If I had turned right, I would have found her 12 minutes. Instead, I didn't. I went left. The GPS, it turns out, had taken her. Uh, it was, should have gone straight and then a right, and we would have been there. Instead, it went past the road that should have turned, went a big round loop, and brought her to what was an unassumed road. When you hear unassumed road, think of a four-wheeler trail, because that's basically what it was. Now, here's the thing. At that point, when my phone was like almost dead, I couldn't, wasn't sure, I couldn't reach Tina. I wasn't sure if I got my, my stepfather. I was now starting to get close to being in panic mode for my wife. I did the last thing that anyone should do. I prayed to God, right? <laughs> I'm joking. I should have prayed first, but instead I was trying to deal with it myself. Silly me. But isn't that about trusting God and how hard it is? I prayed to God. And I just remember in that moment uh, a wave of peace falling on me. Nothing had changed. Tina was still out in the middle of nowhere. I didn't even know if my stepfather even was going to reach me. And nothing 
was looking good, yet at that moment, I knew it was going to be okay. At least for me, not for Tina, I don't know. No, I, that's a, <laughs> I knew, I knew it was going to be, I knew it was going to be okay. I knew she was going to be okay. And we found Tina. We managed to get the car. You would, couldn't believe this road she went down. We managed to get the car turned around. We managed to get the car out. And we laugh about it now. Don't trust your GPS. <laughs> trust God. <laughs> we laugh about that. We are called to trust God. We are called to embrace his authority. We are always going to feel chaos when we're trying to rely on ourselves. God is sovereign. He is in control. Place your trust in God and submit all your ways to his authority. It's going to take, this is going to mean it's a daily action to say, Lord, not my will be done, but yours. And with that, let's close in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, it isn't always easy to relinquish control. In fact, it's so hard at times to place our trust in you. We're sorry that we, we need this reminder again and again and again. Lord, most of us have been let down by others. Our experience says that the only people we can trust is ourselves. But you, God, are different than those who have hurt us in the past. You love us. You never fail. You always keep your promises. Help us, Lord, to daily place our trust in you and to submit our authority, or your, submit ourselves to your authority, recognizing you are sovereign, that you are in control. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. One final song.
Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander. My faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you will call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander. And my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Spirit, lead me where my trust. friends that concludes our service just a reminder there are lots of uh, refreshments there from uh, some sandwiches and such so please stay uh, for a time of fellowship i hope you've been encouraged by today's service i know that i have and i just want to say that i appreciate all of you so much god bless have a great day everyone